Is Chinese AI about to blow the socks off everyone as we see them focusing on their homegrown technology, which America forced them into? We've got a juicy clip here. Was it potentially a mistake from America throttling AI chips into China? Check this out. This was a tweet that went out this morning. This comes from our U.S. AI and crypto czar, David Sachs. Huawei just launched a new AI chip and China has ordered firms to stop buying certain NVIDIA chips. China is not desperate for our chips. It's producing its own and intends to compete globally in the semiconductor marketplace. If U.S. firms are blocked by excessive controls, we risk forfeiting the AI race to China. The hawkish position to help American companies win, not help Huawei build a digital Silk Road is so critically important. As soon as you make anything illegal or you stop trade, you're incentivizing the other side, in this case, China, to develop capabilities and then compete directly with you. And this is about who's going to buy, you know, throughout Europe, through Africa, throughout the rest of Southeast Asia. What chips are these companies going to buy? Is it Intel? And NVIDIA, or is it from Huawei? It, I think it's instructive to look at what happened to computing during the Cold War. And in particular, there was so much siloization in the Soviet Union of their computing stack. They were inventing all sorts of exotic architectures like ternary computers in, in the West and ultimately the world. We settled on a binary architecture, zeros and ones. For computers, the Soviet Union, because in part of the Iron Curtain, was experimenting deep in their tech stack with all sorts of the exotic architectural options that the West wasn't considering. If the situation does play out in a way where there is effectively competition deep into the tech stack between great powers, then I would expect, based on history, that we're going to see, ironically, greater diversity deeper in the stack. Maybe not quite at the level of binary versus ternary computing systems, but certainly I would expect to see more experimentation deep in the stack. Does this ultimately help America by having a great, capable sort of competitor out there? If the U.S. was so overdominant uh, that it was the only player, the incentive to continue innovating is there, but still so much slows down when you got Huawei sort of leveling up to that of NVIDIA, I think you're going to see the White House, you're going to see capital in the United States really tripling down. So is this another, uh, in some way, is this move, is this sort of reality about Huawei and China going to become additional fuel for the U.S. government and the U.S. industries to align? I mean, again, we're in a, in a war footing here. This is a war cry that we just heard from David Sachs. Yeah, I think what is new and interesting to me about what David's saying here is the digital Silk Road. We're not going to lose to China, but if the whole world ends up partnering with China and it's the U.S. versus the world, if, if Huawei becomes the open and friendly partner to the world and the U.S. gets isolationist, that's what I think David is warning us against here. And so, you know, what is Europe going to do? What is India going to do in that 1.4 billion people? Hans, how serious is the threat from China in developing their own homegrown chips and AI models? Are they genuinely competitive or is this all overblown? Well, unfortunately, I think it's a little bit too early to tell right now if this is a very serious threat, but it's also one that I don't think we can dismiss as a possibility either. I mean, if we just look at the history of the Chinese industrial policy and what they've been able to produce with industrial policy over the last couple of decades, it would be dishonest to say that there is no possibility of a threat arising from the AI chips that Huawei is going to be able to make over the next few years or what Chinese open source AI software will be capable of. I mean, if you don't think that Chinese industrial policy is serious business, well, just look at Legacy Auto and what they have been able to achieve there. In just a few short years, GM went from making the majority of its profits by selling cars in China to now hardly being able to sell anything in that market because the domestic offerings are just so good and they're priced so competitively. Currently, we believe that Chinese Silicon Fab is still several generations behind what the West has access through with TSMC and with Samsung, uh, but they are getting very creative with the things that they have. 
most of the equipment that Huawei has been given access to is for 7 nanometer chips, whereas TSMC is currently fabbing all the way down to 2 nanometer. But even just on that 7 nanometer equipment that they have, I believe they've been able to retrofit and upgrade that equipment to where they can actually make 5 nanometer chips currently. And we'll have to see what they're able to do moving forward. So while no, Huawei chips are not going to be competitive with NVIDIA today or any time in the near future, that doesn't mean that 10 years from now Huawei cannot be. But even if we set the quality of the chips aside, China can still compete with the United States in AI overall, even with inferior chips, just by throwing a lot more energy at the problem. And based on the rate that they are currently building out energy generation capacity in China, that's not going to be a challenge for them at all. And so they will definitely have the ability to go head to head with us in the software space from an overall capacity standpoint, as long as they can get their manufacturing up even with older technology chips. Now, with all of that said, thankfully, we do have Jensen Wong and NVIDIA combined with the power and might of TSMC to compete against this Chinese effort. And thankfully, Jensen is no Mary Barra. They really do know how to execute and execute extremely well. So hopefully we'll be able to maintain the lead that NVIDIA has for some time and outpace Huawei's growth well past the point that we have reached artificial general and then potentially artificial super intelligence. So the US made a decision to throttle chips being exported into China. Now, I think that was an interesting move. China had a concentration risk where all of their best chips were coming from the United States. This was then realized, though, when the US temporarily banned the sale of all AI chips, or at least all the higher powered ones, to China. AMD and NVIDIA are now allowed to sell Nerf to chips into China, but not their best products. Do you think that was a mistake, Hans? And then also, so when we start looking forward, what do you think about the impact of US taking a 15% surcharge attacks off of AMD and NVIDIA for all the chips they are selling into China? My thoughts are, or some of, the, some of the questions I want to ask you is around the fact that reduces profitability for AMD, that reduces profitability for NVIDIA, although NVIDIA is making a huge amount of money. Is that at risk of stifling some of the progress, some of the R&D at this critical time? in AI development. So then for you, Hans, what, what do you think is the best play for US moving forward in regards to selling chips to China? Wow, I see you only brought the easy questions for me today. You know, nothing too heavy to uh, dig into here. Well, let me start with the question about whether or not R&D will be stifled at NVIDIA. I think that the obvious answer to that question is going to have to be no. There's just too much money flowing in from too many places. And really, even the chips that were already being sold to China were kind of a side project for NVIDIA. And so I don't think this is going to in any way slow down or impact the core R&D that NVIDIA is doing to advance their manufacturing, their capacity, and then the quality of the technology that's going going into their chips. So then to tackle, was this a mistake? I think it's a very difficult question to answer in a clean way. But I think if you zoom out a little bit and maybe look back to a previous wave of technological competition with Huawei specifically and what happened with 5G networking technology, I think you'll see similar trends that make this decoupling between the United States and China with this critical technology infrastructure pretty much inevitable. So for the same reasons that we didn't want Huawei actually operating 5G networking technology here in the United States and pretty much the entire rest of the world that is aligned with the United States, save for a few exceptions, really agreed with us and did not want to have that networking technology operating on their soil is because the Chinese Communist Party is obviously going to exert control over those devices and they are going to have backdoors and they will be using them as spyware. And this is something that I think they also have legitimate concerns that we would be doing to them. And that's one of the reasons why they don't want to be dependent on our NVIDIA chips, 
our Intel chips or even our AMD chips. And so for the same reasons that we don't want them operating 5G technology here, they don't really want us operating our network technology there. And we certainly won't be sharing our bleeding edge AI chips back and forth between China and the United States or any of our critical allies in any area that we believe is important for national security. And I think one of the things that's become very painfully obvious in the last few years in the realm of geopolitics is that silicon security is national security. That's why we see such a strong push here in the United States this year and under this administration, but even going back to the Biden administration with the CHIPS Act to begin doing a better job of domesticating our chip supply. That way we can have anything that we need in the case of a geopolitical shakeup. And this is the same thing that China is doing right now. They don't want to be dependent on our chips for a number of reasons, not the least of which has to do with their designs on potentially taking back Taiwan sometime in the next five to 10 years. But with all of that said, the real question is, you know, if the United States isn't going to be using Chinese chips from Huawei and China is not going to be using NVIDIA chips, and then there's going to be this competition in the actual software for AI, then the battleground is really just where does the rest of the world shake out? You know, do we have a repeat of what happened with Huawei's 5G networking technology and pretty much anyone who is aligned with the West? So the EU, many of our trading partners in the Asia Pacific region, including Japan and Korea and Singapore, you know, are they going to continue to buy from NVIDIA? Or will China be able to pull them into their orbit and their sphere of influence with those Huawei chips? I think anyone who purchases those chips does have to just recognize that they are going to be allowing the Chinese Communist Party to have a backdoor into critical things that they're doing with those AI chips. So I think that will really be the trade-off that maybe they can get Huawei chips for cheaper than NVIDIA chips, but you're going to pay for that difference in cost with security. And I do believe there are going to be a number of countries for whom that will actually be an acceptable trade-off, that they don't really have anything that they wish to hide from the CCP or they are already balled into the CCP such that it doesn't really matter if they have access to a little bit more data. But then there will be a number of other places where that's not an acceptable trade-off at all. And if that is indeed the way that this goes, as long as the domestic production here in the United States of software and then the international production capacity of our allies is able to stay at the forefront of of the AI technology frontier, then I think we'll have a nice stable equilibrium play out. Before we wrap, I have to say a huge thank you to my co-host, David. Besides being a great co-host with a great accent, David has been one of the key figures behind the scenes helping me to grow this channel from 1,000 to over 16,000 subscribers and to put out regular shows that reach millions of views every year. When he's not moonlighting with me, he usually works with businesses who want to leverage YouTube to grow their online presence, and he's looking to take on more. If you want to get more clients and more brand awareness for your business using YouTube, I definitely recommend him. You can book a free call with him using the link in the description below.